So most, uh, most of you probably have had some feelings along the way of, you know, what can I do? How can I help? And, and that's exactly the kind of situation I found myself in um, about two months ago, you know, an engineer and t technology is, it's got to have something we can do here. Um, and I came across, I became involved in a project that was started on the IT campus by Professor Ron Revest and some of his colleagues. Um, in, in order to stop the start of the pandemic, uh, we would like to try to isolate, identify people who become infected um, in a way that allows everybody else to go about their, their business and their and their their day-to-day -day activities. Um, and we also wanted to do it in a way that preserved people's privacy. And so Professor Avest um, and his team came up with a really great uh, concept um, that both preserved privacy and used cell phone technology to be able to um, determine if you were in close contact with someone who may later come to develop um, COVID. And so they started the program called Private, Private Automated, Automated Contact Tracing. And so this, prod, so this project, the PACT project, there's a website on the MIT campus and we can provide that to you, has been doing an, an awful lot of research and trying to figure out how you can detect um, close proximity between people using signals such as the um, Bluetooth signals, the receive signal strength indicator and in Bluetooth that every cell phone is um, pinging out very, very regularly. So this effort started on camp, started on campus. Um, it's grown to a very, um, very large effort that includes both folks at Lincoln, folks at campus, folks in industry who've been collecting some data um, to support this. And there are a lot of people really racking their brains on how can we make this um, a, a really successful um, uh, mode of, of detection for, for tracing the spread of um, COVID-19. Um, so this is a, a problem that is incredibly timely, but we also think this is a problem that we'd like to throw at you as a challenge. And so while everyone has, um, you know, many people have cell phones that they can use, you don't need a cell phone to detect Bluetooth signals. In fact, you have a little bit more flexibility if you can build your own. So you're being provided Raspberry Pis, therefore you get the Pi packed. Um, and we'd like to see what you can come up with as a creative way to, um, to define or detect proximity between two Bluetooth enabled devices. Um, so we have a great cohort here. There are almost 180 people that are summer students, some are even Lincoln Laboratory staff who've decided to participate in this. Um, and we're gonna, Ramu is gonna get you started. He's gonna walk you through this project and there are some things that we wanna see you do, but I think I encourage all of you to just take, uh, take this as an opportunity to be creative, try new ideas, see what works, see what, um, see what succeeds and see what you can share with the larger community. Um, and over the course of the next four weeks, we're going to have a series of seminars that are kind of centered on the PACT program. So we're going to have um, a doctor from Mass General Hospital who um, specializes in public health and um, pandemic management. Her name is Dr. Louise Ivers, so she's agreed to come speak with you. Um, we also have one of the co-PIs from the PACT program, Dr. Mark Sisman, who will be um, uh, presenting an overview of the larger scope of the PACT program. And um, we also have a lecture on um, cryptography, so you can actually understand what goes into making something very private and, um, and privacy preserving. Um, so I, I welcome all of you. I look forward to seeing all the great things that you're going to do over the next four weeks. Um, and I'll take this opportunity now to, to introduce Ramu. Ramu um, is a staff member at Lincoln Laboratory who I've worked with for many, many years. He's incredibly creative, he's incredibly energetic. He has a, a background in RF technology and radar systems, um, but as well as, well as <clears throat> um, expertise in signal processing and machine learning. And so you're in great hands. Ramu is a veteran Beaverwork Summer Institute instructor. Um, he's led a couple of the courses over the past couple of years and uh, you're in great hands. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ramu and um, Good luck, everybody, and uh, I'll check in uh, in about a week. Ramu, Thanks. before you start, we're, um, I just forgot to say that this is being recorded, so just so people know. Thanks, Jen. Really appreciate the introduction and the kind, kind words. Um, so, again, 
just uh, need uh, just to reintroduce myself, Ramu uh, Bhagavatla, so I have a MIT Lincoln Laboratory staff member, uh, the Airborne Radar Systems and Techniques group, which is Jen Watson's former group. Um, but that said, uh, I'm really excited to be helping you guys do some basically independent research uh, that will hopefully uh, contribute to the larger goal of, uh, I would say, developing contact tracing technology that will uh, put the nation, if not the world, in a better position to uh, sort of get back to normal and address future, hopefully, farther in the future um, pandemics such as this. But that said, um, the bottom line for this project is it's really up to you all to decide what are the hypotheses under the sort of blanket topic of Bluetooth-based contact tracing that you want to explore. And the reason why it's called an independent project is we're providing you the tools the tools with which you will be able to ex freely explore these ideas and come to us with both the question you think you want, you're trying to answer, the evidence you've gathered to answer that question, and the answer you actually come with, come up with, i.e. the solution. And so um, along the way, we're gonna sort of not only walk you through a number of the core technologies, and concepts that you'll want to familiarize yourself with, but give you some sort of what I would say breadcrumbs or good first ideas, but they should by no means should be your only or last ideas. We're looking for creativity and originality in what you propose. Um, and so just to um, reiterate, uh, reiterate the uh, format of this uh, is uh, this is the sort of weekly discussion that's gonna happen on sort of a not every week basis, but um, on every on a topic basis. And so during this discussion, we'll be talking about the topic for the week, which in this case is introducing you to the project and um, sort of uh, trying to give you the, the starting uh, information you need to get that started. Um, and we'll, we'll be answering questions live, so you can use the Q&A or the chat. Um, and so we, I have that open here. Um, Lisa and, and Joel will uh, try to field those as they can and, and uh, push them along to me when they can. Um, so I see a few that are unanswered. So are we allowed to keep the Raspberry Pi kits? Yep, that got answered. Um, will our progress in Pi Pact impact our involvement in BWSI? Um, so nothing formal. Uh, your performance in PyPact is in no way tied um, formally to your performance in BWSI and in the other courses, but obviously it's a time management question. Um, so by signing on to this, you're obviously try making a commitment and by signing up to BWSI, uh, sort of the more standard courses, um, you're making commitment to that as well. So please just do your, um, you're all way more capable than I probably was when I was your age, so I'm sure your time management skills are equally better than mine are, or were, <laughs> maybe still are. Uh, what age group is this designed for? Um, I would say this is probably designed for, uh, I would say maybe freshman high school, particularly those who have some uh, familiarity with programming, if not in Python directly, but at least maybe something like Java, or a simpler or even more advanced language. It's not terribly um, heavy lift, but you do need some uh, familiar with basic programming constructs and some object oriented things. Um, so what type of HCMI will the kit have? So I'll save some of these as we go along. Uh, so I will answer the rest of these as we go along, but let's let's dive in so uh, we can start uh, talking about specifics. So I'm going to attempt to share these slides. Okay. So right now you all should see a black screen, and now if I do this right, and I will now ask. 
Joel or Lisa to confirm that they can see a full screen version of the slides. Full screen looks good, Ramu. All right, excellent. All right, so we will we will post these slides um, as well. We'll share these, so don't worry. Um, if you uh, if we go over something or you don't catch it, you'll you'll get it. Um, so this is the Pi Pact uh, project introduction, and as you can see here, we have our wonderful logo, which is two radiating beavers. <laughs> We're MIT. Everything's a beaver, and this is a you know RF for radio frequency based uh, projects. So so let's get started. Um, I think. Come on. All right. Okay. So what is Pi Pact? So PyPact or BWCI PyPact, you know, is basically an opportunity. It's an opportunity for you guys to explore a number of topics. The top level one is to explore how Bluetooth technology can be applied to proximity detection for COVID-19 contact tracing. That's just the top level goal. If you um, help us solve that, you'll, um, meet uh, what uh, Jen Watson has said, you'll be contributing to a very noble and a high impact effort. But along the way, you're gonna do a few other things. You're obviously gonna learn about Bluetooth. You're gonna create a data collection platform. You're gonna collect and analyze data. I'm missing a word here. Um, collect and analyze data. You're gonna learn and apply some detection theory. And you're going to, like I said, contribute to the larger um, COVID-19 mitigation efforts, specifically PACT, the private automated contact tracing. And so um, I searched long and hard for you know, an infographic that sort of explained what contract tracing was. And this is the best one I could find about um, from the CDC, but it's about Ebola. But, you know, and a lot of, you know, except for the R number, um, it's very similar. Um, it's the same process, but we'll, we'll talk more about this later. But you know, here are sort of the, the core things that are involved. It's the concept of contact tracing, the technology of Bluetooth, and then the COVID-19 or the coronavirus motivating this work. Okay. Um, so uh, with that said, Let's see if this works. Okay, so this is a video that I hope will actually play. Oh, can you guys, and I'm not sure if it's really gonna stream very well um, via Zoom. It's, you know, video inception basically. Um, but the link is uh, right below the, right below it. And so this is a nice little video from um, University of Texas Health uh, Center in Austin explaining what contact tracing is. And this explains it from the perspective of just what is the goal of contact tracing. It does not, ex um, it, it does not get specific or is not colored by using Bluetooth technology or other sort of uh, more digital means to accomplish this. So let's see if this plays. So uh, the weirdly upbeat music aside, um, so that's contact tracing, right? It's the idea here is basically to trace this transmission. And as you saw from that video, 
the um, sort of legacy approach, the traditional approach is basically all completely manual. Basically, contact tracers basically go out and learn the movement history of everyone that may have come into contact with somebody who's known to be positive for, in this case, or in our current circumstances, COVID-19. And as you can might imagine, this is a very laborious, non-scalable solution. Um, so that said, you know, usually when the words laborious and non-scalable uh, come into play, uh, engineers think of technology. Um, you know, how can we apply various types of technology to sort of reduce that burden? Um, and that is pretty critical when you look at the basic infection rates of COVID-19 currently. If we were expected, or if we plan to trace every single person that was infected in the US um, cumulatively thus far, um, you can see how we probably more than likely um, have to reach out and contact a very large fraction of the country to the point where it may just seem infeasible. So um, as we go through this, uh, you know, sort of going back to normal, we need contact tracing in order to uh, allow us to go back to normal, but in a way that is actually feasible. So that's where PACT comes in, private automated contact tracing. And so this next video is from the PACT program that should show how this, basically the concept of contact tracing is being done with the various types of technology um, that Jen Watson had brought up, Bluetooth, uh, cryptography, anonymization, so on. So I'm gonna start this. When a patient is diagnosed with an infectious disease like COVID-19, an important step in slowing the transmission of the disease is contact tracing. Contact tracing seeks to identify the people who have had close contact with the infected individual and who therefore may be infected themselves. This targeted strategy reduces the need for stay-at-home periods. However, manual contact tracing is subject to a person's ability to recall everyone they have come in contact with over a two-week period. There is need for an automated, privacy-preserving contact tracing system. MIT is developing one such system. Cell phones are constantly advertising their presence using Bluetooth. These advertisements, which we call chirps, can be anonymous and contain no location data or personally identifiable information. Every phone stores a list of all the chirps that it has sent and all the chirps it has overheard from nearby phones within arm's reach. The MIT system utilizes these lists to enable contact tracing for people diagnosed with COVID-19. This system not only identifies contacts, it also estimates the distance between individuals, as well as the amount of time they spent in close proximity to each other. When a person is diagnosed with COVID-19, public health professionals would coordinate with the patient to upload the list of chirps sent out by their phone to a public database. Meanwhile, people who have not been diagnosed can have their phones do a daily scan of the public database to see if their phones have overheard any of the chirps used by people later diagnosed with COVID-19. This indicates that they were in close, prolonged contact with that anonymous individual. Depending on the circumstances of contact, they may be referred to the public health authorities, who may recommend varying courses of action, including symptom watch, testing, and self-quarantine. Um, so that's packed, and as you can see here, it's the same contact tracing methodology, except it's using your phone to automate that um, process of not only recording who you've been in contact with, but sharing it and sharing it anonymously, which is where, you know, as a key privacy concern. 
Um, so uh, as you will learn through the various uh, seminars uh, slash webinars we'll hold, um, hold uh, uh, starting next week on, um, you'll learn about more about PAC, how it's being executed, how it's going, and what its impact has thus far been. But um, this project, why it's appropriately named PyPact, is to use that same PACT concept, but using Raspberry Pis as their baseline. All right? Um, so that being the case, uh, that being the case, we'll uh, talk about that next, basically how we're going to go through all this. But we're gonna first talk about a couple of key technologies that you will, I'll introduce now, but we will be providing some background reading for you to go through and get f familiarize yourself with more. Um, I do see a question here, are we designing a Raspberry based, Pi based client for this platform? Um, so it is Raspberry Pi based. Um, we will provide you a baseline collection stack, basically um, a transmitter and a receiver that you can interchange between the two Pis. Um, but it's open source. You will be welcome to modify it as you see fit to better serve what you think your um, experiments, your hypotheses, your sort of basic um, project construction demands, but um, we've, we've taken a little bit of effort to make sure as reasonably robust, but um, you know, we, we welcome basically uh, new additions to it, modifications, and, and we'd love to hear of, of, uh, about those from you. But um, you will have to familiarize yourself with some Python modules, which we also reference in the background uh, reading material. So moving on. So let's start with what Bluetooth is, um, because I think we can, I don't really need to belabor the idea of how, what contract tracing does and how it's, you know, manually done and how um, if a phone cannot, if a device can automatically record when you're in the proximity of uh, a non uh, folks, um, how that's all done. So let's talk about the technology that sort of underpins it. So big block of text up top. This is just, you know, lifted straight from Wikipedia. Um, not gonna read out loud, but the main thing to note about it is that it operates in this, in the, what's called the ISM band, which is basically the same band or the spectra of the, of the um, same frequencies of the spectrum that your standard sort of home-based 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi operates in. Um, and a number of other devices. Um, this is a generally very open band, you know, filled with consumer devices. Um, and some interesting little tidbits about it is it was actually named after 10th century Danish king. Um, it is literally named after a Viking king. So that's kind of fun. Um, it's a name that way because, uh, you know, this uh, Viking king was uh, trying to unite all the Danish tribes into one, and that's sort of what Bluetooth is att attempted to do back when it was originally proposed. It was to unite a number of separate wireless standards into one. Basically, wireless standards that were designed to address sort of point-to-point, -point, device to device connectivity, um, which is what most of us use it for connecting our phones to our headphones, connecting, um, uh, connecting, uh, you know, to uh, home uh, automation devices, whatnot. Um, I see a question here that says, the point of the project is to find our own solution for COVID-19 detection. The point of this project is not necessarily that in itself. The point of this project is for you to help us explore the space of using Bluetooth for proximity detection for contact tracing. And that is done by a number of ways. It's done, and we'll, we'll get into more of this later, but maybe to skip ahead a little bit, it's done by collecting data, because we can always use more data, by an analyzing that data, by observing the variables that you know, cause differences or you know, result in various phenomenology in your data. And at the sum of all of that is designing a solution 
to the overall problem. If you can walk that whole path and come up with even a solution to a subset of the large task that is COVID-19 contact tracing, then I would consider that a grand success. But by no means are we expecting you to solve the packed problem all by yourself. We have obviously a, a great number of professional engineers and scientists working on this, working very hard. And you, you know, you're all very, I'm sure you're all very capable, but um, I would not be the one to set the bar that high. Um, but prove me wrong by all means. So um, one of the key things to note about, uh, and that little picture um, here is a relief of that uh, Danish king being baptized by a pope. Um, but that's just to show you that he was real. Um, but one of the kind of the key things to note is that since Bluetooth operates in the same band as a number of other devices, specifically things like Wi-Fi, and other ISM band radios, it's both um, the source and victim of lots of interference. Basically, all these devices are competing for use of the same chunk of the spectrum. And so, uh, like, like any other, like, you know, finite resource, like a highway, you know, the more things you put on the highway, the more congested it's gonna get, and eventually nothing's gonna move. That's the same concept here. Um, and, you know, we all, I'm sure every single one of us has, I'm sure a lot of us at least have at least one pair of Bluetooth headphones, if not more. I'm guilty of that. Um, and no, no shortage of other Bluetooth devices. Um, and then, of course, my Wi-Fi. So needless to say, it's a very congested spectrum. And Bluetooth was really designed for point-to-point -point connectivity. It was designed to basically, originally, just to say device A connect to device B, and you two exchange information. It was eventually with um, sort of later iterations, it was designed to scale up a little bit more where a number of devices could form sort of ad hoc networks together called um, PANs. And basically they could communicate amongst themselves, but the size of these networks is, was very small, basically eight or so. And so, you know, this begs the question of how does Bluetooth scale up to detecting and, you know, keeping track of, you know, more than just eight people around me. You know, if I'm in a store, if I'm almost anywhere outside of my house, there's a good chance there's more than eight people around me within Bluetooth range, which, you know, a, a decent Bluetooth transmission range could be, you know, 15, 20 meters. Um, and so you can think easily see there being at least eight people in a 15, 20 meter radius circle. Um, so how do I make sure I see all those people or I know that they're present? And so that's um, where we come to the next concept, which is Bluetooth beacons. Um, I'll answer the remaining questions here. I will answer shortly. Um, so again, just a, a lift from Wikipedia, but Bluetooth beacons are basically um, transmitters dedicated to Bluetooth. Um, so it'll be there what are called low energy devices, Bluetooth low energy, with the which is a specific standard of Bluetooth that is designed to sip or use very small amounts of energy. Um, because originally when Bluetooth was designed, it was designed for sort of bursty, fixed, reliable transmission, which meant it used a lot of energy, but didn't use it often. Didn't need to broadcast all the time. It only broadcasted when it needed to. Beacons, on the other hand, are a lot like lighthouses, or, you know, or a lot like um, uh, traffic signs. They have to be present all the time. They have to be broadcasting their information all the time to be useful. And so if we were to use or we were to broadcast um, such Bluetooth signals in the same way we did when um, Bluetooth was originally designed, we drain the battery of your phone just like that. I'm sure you've all maybe have noticed this when you're listening, if you've ever observed how long your battery lasts when your you know, headphones are connected or when you're listening to music. Um, via Bluetooth, uh, how much faster your, your battery may drain. 
Um, so low energy um, specification was designed to sort of address this by simplifying the messages that were sent out and by minimizing the amount of energy that was used. And so there's just a couple of the graphics here, and I apologize for the size. It can't really get them necessarily to fit better. Um, but the graphics here sort of illustrate how beacons are used both generally for the original purpose, which was originally for marketing and uh, product analytics, to how they're being used for contact tracing, specifically how Apple and Google are considering using beacons for the Bluetooth contact tracing infrastructure that they're provisioning. Um, and so if you go through the top graphic, you'll see the idea here is you basically have a number of beacons that you deploy. And so the idea here for stores or marketing is that you put your beacons in your store. You might put them at the entrance. You might put them next to certain displays or maybe in different sections of your store. And you ident you uniquely identify each beacon by sort of where or what it was associated with. So I might have a beacon associated with jeans or a beacon associated with shirts in a clothing store. And so as it's broadcasting its beacon, your phones are sort of going, or, or your people are walking by with phones and they hear the beacon and they respond to the beacon by saying, hey, look, I saw your beacon, I'm gonna respond. And that gives the beacon um, not only notice that you're there, but also it can also target very specific information to you because it knows you're by the jeans. So it can send you, here's a special on jeans or you're by the shirts, here's a special on shirts. Um, naturally, this notion of targeting is where the privacy concerns arise when it comes to contact tracing, which is why it's very critical for PAC to anonymize these contacts, um, anonymize them by using cryptography, by storing things in a um, completely anonymous fashion. Uh, but for marketing purposes, for their original purposes, anonymity wasn't exactly high on the priority list. Um, so we have Bluetooth, we have Bluetooth beacons, all right? So um, the basic concept is that, right, your phone is gonna be a one, your phone is gonna alternate between being a beacon and being a receiver or being a listener. So it's gonna tell everybody who it is anonymously. And it's also gonna to listen to all those anonymous broadcasts from everybody else. And this sort of two-way exchange is how we are going to establish proximity of different devices and therefore different people. So if this, was, if this worked all really well, what are the challenges, right? What, what are the challenges associated with, um, with uh, doing this? Well, they come down, there are a number of challenges, but one of the main things, all right, is that the basic notion of using Bluetooth for proximity detection is based on using a, a signal measure called received signal strength indicator or RSSI, as basically a, a measure of how strong the received Bluetooth signal is, all right? And the notion is that it is proportional to the signal strength, or proportional to how close a person or a device is. So the notion is when, you, when two devices are closer in range, or closer together, you will have a higher RSSI. When they are further apart or greater in range between them, they will have a lower RSSI, right? This is just like, you know, when you use your voice or audio. The closer you are to the source of the sound, the louder it sounds. And obviously the further away, the softer it sounds. Same basic principle. We're just dealing with electromagnetics rather than acoustic waves in this case. However, like all radio frequency or RF based forms of communication, there's a loss of signal strength that will occur for a number of factors. And there's so many factors that we couldn't get into all of them. But amongst these many factors, the most immediately impactful are the range itself, which makes sense, right? We want it to vary with range. Um, that makes a lot of sense. 
but it also varies with obstruction or something in the way between the of the path between these two devices all right is there is, is if the device is in my pocket that's an obstruction just the fabric of your clothes can be an obstruction if it's in a bag if it's if the if your phone is in front of you and your in in the path between your phone and another device is through your body your body is an obstruction and then of course walls you know walls building material all this sort of stuff anything can be an obstruction basically because it impedes the path of the signal and then even more problematic or even more sort of subtle and less obvious is atmospheric conditions the signal strength can actually vary based on the humidity of the day you know if there's more water in the air it actually reduces the signal strength compared to a drier day it doesn't have a nearly as much an effect as obstructions do but it does have an effect so what does this all mean right so what am i saying well if i compared to when i'm close together when there's no obstructions and when there's a very dry day i'll have lots very high rssi compared to when i'm far away there's obstructions in the way and it's a humid day when i would have low rssi so you know what's what's the problem here right you know i'm still sort of if if i'm still correlating range with signal strength what's the challenge well the challenge is that lots of a given rssi can come from any number of unique combinations of these factors so as just a sort of example i could be very close to two devices could be very close together but if they're separated by a wall the signal strength that they see or the rssi that they see could be very similar to the rssi strength or rssi signal i would see when those two devices are far away without any obstructions in the place so we clearly have two different ranges in these examples but there i'm seeing the same rssi value so how can i tell what the range is you know if i was just looking at rssi you know it might be extremely difficult if not impossible just based on that one measurement just based on rssi right so this ambiguity right this uncertainty is one of the key challenges to overcoming um or to implementing bluetooth based contact tracing right and so this is one of the key focuses of pi pact for you all to use this data collection platform we're going to help you we're going to provide you and help you create to explore right explore this idea of how unique is this basic hypothesis or how reliable is this hypothesis of using rssi to measure range right and in what in what scenarios is it both reliable and what scenarios is it unreliable right we are interested in both those things and because at the end of the day like any good tool you need to know when you can reliably use it if we deploy a tool a contact tracing application where we cannot be assured that it is reliably assessing range in all the scenarios in which we expect it to be used or at least all the scenarios in which we advertise it to be used then we're going to get a lot of erroneous data which can obviously may create more challenges than it helps solve so it's pretty critical that we understand these issues and try to mitigate them either by knowing that the you know solution can't be applied in certain scenarios or finding solutions to those problematic scenarios so which way um your contribution to this goes is a lot of it's up to you we'll help you by giving you some sort of good first steps but we are not going to be prescriptive it is very much up to you to uh make this determination of sort of how to explore the space all right
this is a good chance for me to catch up with some of these questions. Um, okay, so uh, okay, I'm going to answer some of these later. Uh, record. So I see a question. If we are using this for contact tracing, then why wouldn't a major obstruction like a wall also lower the change of COVID-19 spread? You're right. Um, so when I guess I'm interpreting this question from, uh, I will just use, uh, I won't mention names just for um, anonymity at the moment, but I interpret this question as asking, uh, hmm. if you're using this for contact tracing, then why wouldn't a major obstruction like wall? Well, if you're asking from an epidemiological standpoint, I'm not necessarily the right person to answer that or a medical standpoint. I, I would guess they do, but that's not my area of expertise. The, the challenge is though, is if we deploy a, uh, this uh, system and it mistakenly sort of associates, um, you know, we, then, that, there's a chance a false positive might occur, right? That two people are separated by a wall and the system thinks they're close together because maybe we accidentally de uh, design, there's a design flaw or, or a setting set somewhere, how wrong, and we get a false positive. So now that um, this false positive can lead to a whole uh, series of events, right? Where we have to notify the person who now, you know, has to further be notify others and so on and so forth. So false positives create unnecessary burden. Um, but that's kind of a question of how do we deploy the system um, and how do we design it. So to that end, I think, uh, I think uh, it's a very valid question, but I would suggest you might ask that for our PACT uh, webinar speakers. Um, would the location all also matter, like an open space versus enclosed slash smaller room? Absolutely. Um, like an echo in a room, uh, Bluetooth signals bounce and they can create interference with themselves or create further ambiguities. So the signal is actually relatively weak in comparison so that generally, unless you're transmitting in a closet, um, anything that's sort of like a living room or a bedroom, you know, is generally okay. But you will see a difference between like being outdoors and being inside, but not significantly. You, you know, and this is this is part of the exploration I would encourage you guys to do. Quantify those differences, quantify them and see, um, is there enough difference between them that I have to design my approach or design different approaches to accomplishing the same end goal, you know? Uh, what version of Bluetooth that the device has? It does not, so the only sort of, um, so the, the Pies we provide you will be um, just fine. They're Bluetooth, um, I think they're Bluetooth version five, not the latest revision of version five. Um, if you wish to bring your personal devices into the mix, you will need to be at least Bluetooth four because that's when the BLE beacons were introduced. Um, we'll, I'll add a little how-to guide about that later. But, um, but the Pies we provide you are Bluetooth, or Bluetooth version five and Bluetooth is entirely backwards compatible. Um, just beacons are not necessarily. Um, so I think that answers that. Uh, are we trying to develop solutions and test them or just come up with the ideas? You're definitely trying to develop the solutions and test them, all of the above. Come up with ideas, develop the experiments, the data collection process, the collect the data, experiment, evaluate. You guys, this is a research project and we are sort of letting you loose. So um, trust me, I will provide background re reading. It's at the end of this chart deck. I will also post it in Piazza. Will there be any office hours from each lecture? Um, so I will be giving all the lectures. You'll be stuck with me. <laughs> Um, we will have a Q&A session every Friday at this time, 1600 to 1700 or 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. 
or Eastern Daylight Savings Time, EDT, um, where you will, and we'll get into a little bit, but we're running up on time, so let me keep going. Um, okay, so, uh, sorry, let me keep going. We're, we're nearing that. Um, so let's just get into what the main project goals are. So the three main project goals um, that we already shared with you, the top level descriptions in the welcome packet. So you're gonna build a Raspberry Pi based Bluetooth signal collection platform. You're gonna configure and deploy a pair of Raspberry Pis. You're gonna familiarize, familiarize yourself with our baseline collection software that we'll provide via GitHub. You're gonna modify that collection software as you see fit. You're more than welcome to use it out of the box. But if you want to make it fancier, you wanna add a GUI, you wanna, trust me, the sky's the limit. I'm really excited to see what you can do because I know a number of you are probably very savvy, very um, good programmers. And as you see as a refrain here, document, document, document. Your final submission is gonna be a report, but we need documentation because if your final report really wows us, we wanna be able to recreate what you do. We wanna leverage it. And if there's no documentation, we ain't gonna be able to do that. And you're not gonna be able to get the credit for it. So make sure you document your code. You're gonna collect data using this platform. So you're not only are you gonna, you're gonna formulate those contact tracing hypotheses. So those hypotheses might be hypothesis as simple as what does it take? Hypothesis is, hi null hypothesis is um, I, am, I am too far away for uh, COVID-19 to spread. And that distance is six meters at 10 minutes. All right, that's H0. H1 might be I am within six meters for at least 10 minutes. You know, it could be something like that. As simple as that. And now I wanna go test that hypothesis. Does, does Bluetooth RSSI support that? You can further refine this hypothesis by saying, well, let me now split that gross or that very general hypothesis into, does that still hold indoors versus outdoors? Or does that hold when the device has a body, right? When the two devices have a body in between them? Does it still hold when there are two bodies in between them? Does it hold when the device is in my pocket? You know, these are all the hypotheses you're encouraged to explore, but you will need to be the arbitrator of which ones, because again, this is an independent project. We're not here to necessarily be prescriptive. And develop the experiments to test these hypotheses. You're gonna execute said experiments and then you're gonna share your data. Uh, we are, we're setting up a Google Drive for you guys to push your data to, um, and you guys will um, basically be pushing it in a format that will come be described in the GitHub uh, drop. And then finally, uh, you're gonna develop processing algorithms. We call them processing algorithms, but they're really detection algorithms that are gonna perform that proximity detection. So you're gonna learn some very basic proximity uh, theory or, or very basic detection theory. And here's a quick, here's the simplest detection theory I could give you is if RSSI is greater than or equal to this threshold, you are too close. It's as simple as that. But it can get more complex, you know? It gets more complex by, for example, by saying, instead of just basing that on one RSSI measurement, let me base it on N, multiple RSSI measurements. And I will say you're too close if I see at least some fraction of those be greater than this threshold. And the sky's the limit, trust me, it can get as complicated or as simple as you'd like, but again, area for you to explore. And then you're obviously going to test and evaluate those algorithms on your data and as it's available and pertinent to your experiments, the data that your fellow participants will share. And then obviously you're gonna share those results um, with analysis. We just don't wanna see like, here's my accuracy. It's not gonna be one number. You need to explain where, what the experiment was, where the number came from, why you think it's either valid or maybe even invalid and where to go next. And we'll get into all this as we get to those stages of all right, overall schedule. Um, so it's basically split into four main topics. Here we are on week one, where we're going to, we're going over the product introduction, project introduction right now. We'll do some software and hardware familiarization via GitHub and, and Piazza later. Um, weeks two and three is when you're gonna start collecting your data. Weeks four and five is when you should be developing your algorithms. 
Now week six is when you're gonna put your report together. These are not strict boundaries. Feel free to advance, go faster or go slower. You know, take your time, uh, but be smart about it. You know, don't get bogged down in collecting perfect data and don't get bogged down in developing perfect algorithms. Trust me, I know from experience that if I see a, you know, a PD or a, uh, uh, a score of 100% a perfect score, I'm gonna be suspicious. You know, this is the real world. Perfect rarely ever exists, okay? And then on a weekly schedule, it does vary week to week because sometimes we'll not have the webinar, the packed webinar, for example, this week. And we don't always have the discussions, um, but that's the Monday. And again, to clarify, the Zoom invite that we provide to everybody is just this big to accommodate that whole window. When this ends, or when we end in the afternoon at 13.30 or 1.30 p.m. Eastern EDT, um, the Zoom, the meeting ends. The Zoom will be on, but that's fine. Uh, we will have a Q&A session every week just to help field questions, and we'll get into how that works in a second. All righty, um, lots of questions coming up. Um, what do we do this week? Uh, so you're gonna do background reading. You're gonna get yourselves familiar with the various, with Bluetooth, with contact tracing. Once I post the code, and I apologies, we're, as you might imagine, we're juggling a lot of balls around here. Um, the code will go up shortly on the GitHub and you'll familiarize yourself with the code. Um, are we working in groups for this project or only by ourselves with some staff guidance? Um, we have not considered groups explicitly, but you're welcome to collaborate. Um, in order to get a certificate of completion, you will have to submit your own report. All right, um, but that does not preclude collaboration. By all means, share ideas, share data, you know, code review, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But we will sort of look out for simple copy and paste. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, so the Q&A session. So we're, we have these every Friday, 1600, 1700. It's an opportunity for you to ask clarifying questions to the instructors. Um, in order to make this go smoothly and to fit and to make maximum use of the one hour we have scheduled, um, you should submit your questions via Piazza to the Q&A sessions folder, all right? Um, uh, by the day prior, so that would be Thursday by 1700 to give us some time to look over them, see what are sort of, um, questions that are being asked a lot or are of high impact, because that's the order in which we're gonna answer them, just to get the most utility out to everybody. Questions we don't enter, answer in the Q&A session, we'll get to in, in Piazza. Uh, can we make some communication platform uh, for the program? Lisa or Joel, um, do you wanna hop in and just say whether or not the Slack or will be set up for PyPact? So we weren't going to set it up because we thought we decided we were just going to use Piazza um, for, you know, communicating, communicating back and forth with one another. It's definitely something that um, we can look into, though. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And I'm just going to get to um, this last slide real quick. Um, so and then I'll answer all the questions. So we'll probably go a little bit over 1500, but um, so there's a couple of course pages at the Piazza page. You all should have received a registration link when you registered. Um, we'll post the GitHub and the Google Drive on Piazza and update these slides um, shortly. Uh, this is where the GitHub is where the reference code will be provided. It's also where you're gonna sub more, submit the, um, your code uh, to the org. So you're gonna, you're gonna create your own repo and submit to your own repo. You're welcome to also use it for your own code, code um, version control. Um, the Google Drive is there for files that are too large for GitHub. So, and also we, we hope you will be putting your data there. Um, just makes more sense. Really no reason necessarily to version control data. Um, you know, if there's bad data, leave it. If it's good data, leave it. If it's data, leave it. Just, you know, you wanna describe um, the data and we'll be able to look at it. 
So hardware, everyone um, will be receiving a hardware package next week. It's been put in the mail, um, priority mail. So it should hopefully be landing on your doorsteps um, early next week. Um, you've been given a list of items you need to provide. Um, there was a question about uh, internet connectivity. Um, you do not need high speed internet for this uh, necessarily, but you will be downloading a Raspberry Pi image, uh, uh, basically an OS image to burn onto an SD card. And uh, that is gonna be relatively large, 16 gigs. So you'll wanna get that started. You know, it can, it can, you can take your time to download it, but depending on your connectivity speed, it could take a little bit of time to download. Um, the bottom line is you need some wireless, once you, once you have that downloaded, you don't need high-speed wireless to the Pis. Um, it's just very simple terminal-based commands, so it's very low bandwidth. Um, if you already have a laptop, do we need a separate keyboard and monitor? Um, the only reason you need a separate keyboard and monitor is the initial configuration of the Pi and able to connect it to your home network and configure it to have a static IP is because we, we can't deploy, we don't know your, your wireless networks. Um, so it won't automatically be visible to you um, wirelessly. Um, so you need a way to connect it. Um, will this have an ethernet port? It will be much faster. It will have an ethernet port, but remember that you need to do, you're doing experiments where you're moving the devices around. If you're now connected to an ethernet port, the Pi is connected to an ethernet port, it's gonna be connected to power, which is why we asked you for extension cord. If you connect it to ethernet cord, you're one more, there's one more tentacle on you. You're not gonna have nearly as much freedom to conduct your experiments. You can if you'd like, but keep that in mind. That is another tether. Um, so with that said, last slide, this is the background reading. We're gonna post this on the Piazza as well. So just a quick thing about contact tracing. A lot of stuff about Bluetooth, just some of the basics, some things about Bluetooth low energy, uh, a quick thing that helps you get a sense of, the, again, what, what impacts how far Bluetooth can go in terms of range and what, how much signal will I actually receive and then how these beacons actually work. And then there's a number of Python uh, sort of gener modules you need to learn about. So there's the top two ones are about how to use the Bluetooth modules on, um, the Raspberry Pis via Python. And the bottom two ones, specifically Pandas and NumPy, are both basically data analysis tools. Pandas helps you create nice looking data sets, and NumPy might be useful when you're actually analyzing your data. Um, so uh, let's go through the questions real quick. Will we be giving lessons on how to record and report data effectively? Yes, you will be giving lessons. That'll be the, one of the discussion topic in week in, in next week and we'll also provide a template for how to do this. Is there any baseline level accomplishment required for the project? Like perhaps requiring that everyone design and maybe implement a system for sharing keys or maybe instead requiring everyone to interpret versus I data on their platform. Um, no, we've, to be honest, we don't have a sort of minimum baseline in terms of the expectation of uh, like, you know, here's a, here's a common finish line, at least a minimum finish line for everybody. Um, my perception of what the minimum finish line is that you try each one of these topics, at least in some fashion. You co collect some data, develop a detection algorithm, and then you evaluate it. If you do all of that, I think you've met the minimum requirements, but I, we're not being prescriptive here. And a lot of this just goes to our ability to support the why, the, you know, the scope of this. When collecting data in public space, will we need to follow any laws or regulations or ask for permission to collect data? So as far as transmitting Bluetooth is concerned, there is no legal, no legal, no authority except for, um, let me put it this way. The only legal considerations is when you're physically on property that you need that permission for. So in your house, in public spaces is absolutely fine. In private residences that are not yours, in stores, in otherwise permission-gated areas, 
where you physically need permission to be in, that's a permission you need. You need permission to be there. But the transmission of Bluetooth is what's called unlicensed or basically licensed by part. And no authority can tell you you cannot uh, transmit Bluetooth, all right? It's just where you are depends, okay? What is the maximum or optimal range of Bluetooth on the Pi? Great question. I don't know. <laughs> I've tried to do this in experiment myself a number of times. It varies pretty wildly. I'm going to guess that you can probably get, you know, close to 10, if not 15 meters with these things if they're sort of non-obstructed, sort of straight line between them. But um, I would be excited to hear what you guys find for yourselves. So push the boundaries. If we do not always have access to a monitor, can we SSH into the Pi? That is exactly how we intend for you to do this. Once you have the Pi's configured via the, after you do the initial configuration by hooking them into your network, assigning a static IP, then you will be able to SSH into them and don't need the keyboard, don't need the monitor. It is the keyboard and monitor is only there for the initial configuration. Uh, will our progress in PyPack impact our involvement in BOCI? Again, um, nothing formal. Your performance in one does not um, uh, um, formally impact the performance of the other. So success in one does not mean uh, fail, uh, success in the other, vice versa, or any combination in between. It's a matter of time management. Just, you know, if you're doing both, um, just, you know, I would say the courses have clear and requ clear requirements. This is an independent project, so balance them as you see fit. What other sensors? Uh, is this an individual project or a group project? It is designed to be individual, but again, collaboration is highly encouraged. Um, use Piazza, we'll investigate whether or not we want to provide Slack, but you're welcome to use Piazza as it is, or any other form. Um, if you're talking amongst yourselves, uh, then that, at least I believe that's fine, right? Yep. It's just, uh, if, if you want instructors to be involved, we have to do it via either Piazza or we had to do it in sort of a configured Slack channel. Um, and that takes a little doing. Piazza, there's some sort of working with minors constraints we have to be um, cognizant of. Uh, so what other sensors? Uh, so this, so is the Pi a Bluetooth beacon? The Pi is a Bluetooth module that we can configure to be either a beacon or a um, receiver. And so that's what the code we will provide you will show you how to do. You can alternate between them. They can both be beacons. You can take the code I provide you and if you have extra Pi's, you can put them on other Pi's and you can have multiple beacons. Um, Will we be given some instructions on how to start this project or is it entirely independent and experimental? So once we get past the, um, the background reading, I will give a tutorial on week two about how to get started, including how to, you know, we'll go through a little live demo of how to use the pies, how to collect data, what it looks like. Um, and we'll, we'll give instructions at the, in every one of those um, um, weekly, uh, at the start of each one of those topics to help you get started. Um, but after that, you know, given once we give you the basic structure, it's up to you to evolve it into what you want to do. Um, and I know this may feel a little uncertain to a lot, but welcome to research. Research starts off with a lot, very basic question a lot of times and evolves into something new, into something more specific and something that's based on your own personal experience. Uh, what other sensors can we use to determine contact other than Bluetooth. Um, so on the Pi, nothing. Um, on more generally speaking for um, other devices like your phone, there's been thoughts about using microphones like ultrasonics, um, you know, Wi-Fi, other RF devices. Um, some people even postulate using flashes like light, you know, you have the flash on your camera. Um, there's other things that could be used, like the near field contact sensor that some of you may use to pay for things, you know, storage your credit card, you bring it up to the um, point of sale. Um, though that obviously has the question, if your phones are close enough to be kissing effectively, you're probably too close. You probably need to be sent, you know, if you have COVID-19, that person probably has COVID-19 too. Um, 
do we need to go to places a lot in order to test this? What about social distance? No, you do not necessarily need to go to public places a lot in order to test this. Um, it's all based on the scope of, and, and I, let me put it this way. Please by do not ever feel that you need to put yourself at risk of anything, whether it be uh, risk of contracting COVID, risk uh, of any other sort of personal or, or, or mental or any sort of harm. Never, ever, ever let that um, force you into doing a, a collection or an experiment in a certain fashion. Um, if you do not feel like you you are put harm and you take the, you meet and you take um, reasonable precautions um, and please consult with your parents I, you know don't please let them know what you're doing um, and, and you feel like going into public places is the best way for you to collect the data that is needed for your hypothesis then do so all right just please be responsible about it please be safe um, but uh, just to give you an example, if, if your hypothesis is to test in the outdoors, right, test in open spaces, for those of you who have a backyard or you know, wide open space uh, around your house, test there. You don't necessarily need to go to a park. But if your hypothesis is, what does the signal look like when I'm surrounded by a dozen other phones or a dozen other possibly emitting devices, maybe you need to go somewhere like that. But Again, take appropriate precautions. Can you use a non-Raspberry Pi as a beacon to transmit to a Pi receiver? Yes, you can, but um, I would highly encourage you to at least once use the Pi to Pi. One of the biggest issues with using non-Raspberry Pi devices or sort of devices that you, we don't necessarily know the entire design of is that the exact implementation of Bluetooth on those devices is pretty opaque. So it makes it very difficult to understand exactly what's happening between these two devices. RSSI can vary in some non-transparent ways because of the device construction and not because of the factors I told you. So hence why we're trying to give you the pies because we're removing that uncertainty out of the question. Okay, we're gonna take a few more questions and then I'm gonna call it. Um, if we find Bluetooth is ineffective, can we experiment using GPS or cellular triangulation instead? Um, I would say it would be an interesting ad addition. Instead of using it instead, I would suggest you use it as an addition. See if you can fuse these different sources of information. Because I can tell you numerous countries have already found GPS and cellular triangulation to be insufficient to the task. Hence why a lot of them are using Bluetooth. But if you use both all together, maybe you can get a better result. From my yard, is it legal to take my neighbor's data by using the Bluetooth signals? So if you're referring to your neighbor's transmissions, yes, it is legal. They are transmitting in the wild. If you're listening, you're doing a perfectly entirely passive activity. That is entirely legal. They cannot stop you from doing that. Um, We'll, I'll make a post about an app you guys can download on your phones called NFC Connect. You can actually go out there and see what Bluetooth devices are transmitting right now before the pies get to you. Um, now, if you want to coordinate with your neighbor, that'd be fun, I think. Um, but uh, if you just want to sort of listen to what's happening in the neighborhood, by all means do. Um, you can also transmit, of course, as well, but I don't know if anyone's listening, if your neighbor's listening. Can I use the Bluetooth data that comes from cars on the road for me to use? For example, the data of a person in a car as long, yes, absolutely. Again, if people are broadcasting in the wild, you know, they have basically given up any right to um, limit the use of that data, you know, the reception of that data, because it's out, it's out there. Do we own all the data we gather from project? Are, you after, are we free to do um, yes, you're free to do whatever you'd like with the data. Um, the only sort of license we're applying is the standard sort of MIT license. So as long as you don't commercialize it, um, then I would say you're free and clear. But for any non-commercial use, um, then you are free and clear to use the data, the platform, um, the, uh, the algorithms you use. 
um, whatnot. Um, if there is a commercial interest, please just reach out to us. Um, I don't think we will probably, I doubt there'll be any real issues, but it's worth, it's better to have, um, better for us to get ahead of that issue than not. Wow, 67 questions, and probably a lot were repeats, but that's pretty impressive. <laughs> so, and with that, I'm starting to lose my voice. So um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa for any closing remarks. So it was great to see you all here. If you have questions, first place to go is Piazza. Post your questions there. If you need more help than Piazza can give you, please reach out to us. You have um, my email to do that. Um, and I think that's it. Ramu will be posting stuff in Piazza for you to all get started. And all the items will be going out in the mail um, between tomorrow and Wednesday. You should have them early next week. If you don't have it by Monday, reach out to me. And One last question I'll just answer. Can I turn this in as a science fair data once I finish my research? By all means, please. Um, just obviously I would suggest you disclose to the science fair um, the origin of your uh, data and uh, you know, how the effort originated just for the interest of transparency. To sum it up, is it correct that we are picking an aspect using DLE? Make experience to try and use the different aspects to improve the data. 